Hey, Scott. Nice to see your handsome face. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, sir? Good, good. I'm going to go grab a water real quick. Is that a new room? No. Where was that? I haven't seen that before. This timeout that... room. I haven't seen that room before. Where were you hiding it? Uh, this is a virtual background. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, it's not a real room. Oh, that's awesome. Otherwise, I moved otherwise known as Scott's see. timeout room. See, I can take the computer with me and the room yeah. never changes. Uh, whoa, whoa. Tell me how you do that. I want Bora Bora in my background. Yeah, I, well, I paid some graphic designer to come up with that, and then I just attached it to Zoom. So, okay, all I need is a picture, which I have, of Tahiti. How do yeah. I attach it? You got to tell me how to attach it. You got to go on Zoom, like, settings, and then you go into the backgrounds or something like that. They, they have Wait. an option for a virtual background. Oh, I'm doing it. I wish I could do it right now. Mm -hmm. which, I could take Zoom calls in the bathroom and nobody even knows I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> That'd be my background. I just put that on there. Yeah. <laughs> See, Kevin would actually like that. Right. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. I'm going to have to figure that out. If I could figure out how to do it while we're on this call, I would. All right. Well, uh, your your wait. office can be a disaster. Right. Nobody knows. <laughs> wherever, wherever you're at, it looks like you're in a building wherever or wherever you want to be that's amazing i'm pretty sure you have enough pictures of like the beach that you can just yeah. put as a background from oh, real totally. life experience i could be on a new beach every week dude i've got so many yeah so we have about eight people uh you say nude beach or new beach new new <laughs> Kevin, yeah. stop it I wasn't sure if i caught that this, this is recording new i said <laughs> n-e-w got it um, so we got about eight people registered on the call which I'm super stoked about. Um, if you are all in here right now, we've got Kevin, Scott, Emily, and Robert. Uh, got a couple more that we're waiting on. Eric is actually on a wildfire job as we speak. Um, Eric is what? Get him on there live. Four hours north of you, Scott. Where's that? Eric is about four hours north of you, right? Uh, I don't think he's quite that far, but he's he's up there. <laughs> Depends on traffic. Um, Depends on Robert, yeah. Robert, I love your background. <laughs> Where is it, Bali? I can't see. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, wait, we got to unmute you. You got to unmute yourself. There you go. Awesome. There I am. Yeah, I'm just on the way home, and I, I was like, I got to get it. Robert's hanging out with Robert. Robert's hanging out with Robert. I love friend. it. Love it. All right, guys, I'm going to totally have to get on this whole background thing because now I'm going to be on a new beach every week. New. N-E-W, by the way, I want to pronunciate that correctly. What was that, Emily? You said, you said nude. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Apparently, you've been talking to Kevin too new. much. Yeah, yeah. So, new, 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 I got it, I got it. <laughs> so if any of y'all hadn't seen the video uh, that we put up uh, this this week uh, on uh, our YouTube channel, Emily's one of these guest star dancers that I had on our Ask Anissa question this week. Emily just did the hands-on experience in Billings with this, so that was pretty cool. She's, she's a pretty cool rock star, and you, you guys are kind of on fire over there in Montana as well, right, Emily? Oh, I lost her. Well, yeah, it looked like she was having some service issues there. Yeah, yeah. So, Emily, if you can hear me, um, if you unmute yourself. Um, Stop okay. fart assing around. <laughs> I listen here. You know, we just finished content today. I am exhausted. I'm so sweaty and gross, but here I am <laughs> listening to you. Well, there you go. Well, we can't you smell you over the phone, so that's good. Right. All right. So how's that for part assing around? All right. <laughs> and getting the shit done. All right. So 
you know, the, it's, it's interesting um, what has been going on um, and what spurred this call, which by the way, thank you all for being so patient with us. We haven't been doing our Monday calls for a little bit, got a little bit crazy uh, with just being busy and then going to Montana for the training class and uh, some other personal things that we've been uh, working on, like a big move and different stuff like that, that we're doing. But we definitely need to get back to our Monday calls, have had several of you reach out and tell us exactly that and how much that you missed the calls. So we've got several lined up each week for the next two or three weeks. And uh, they, they should be real good. Hopefully you guys will we'll get back on track with that. All right, so um, today we wanted to talk about a pretty hot topic for most of us. And well, if you live in the United States, it's a hot topic anyway. It seems like it's darn near affecting uh, well over half of our country. And that is the wildfire situations that we've got going on right now. You know, a lot of people um, don't realize when they think of like cat loss work and going out responding to these kind of emergencies, you know, the first thing we always all think about is hurricane, right? Water, um, a, a windstorm. Um, hey, Robert, good to see you. Nice, uh, nice uh, picture there, buddy. Um, oh, you're, you're on a job. Wow. Im impressive. You're joining us. We, we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so one of the nice things, job, that, Robert. right? <laughs> one of the things that uh, gets overlooked a lot, uh, quite often, is you know wildfires <laughs> when you're in a cat loss type situation. And let's face it, anymore it is um, definitely a huge growing concern. And especially right now, pretty much our entire West Coast, and in that I'm going to add Idaho and Montana um are sure. on fire and burning um and it is literally the smoke and situation ash is affecting numerous uh bordering states and even clear as far as michigan i've actually had people send me photographs of how bad um the uh, smoke is in their area and they're that far away from us i know for us personally uh, when this really started going down, we were in Eastern Washington, the Spokane area, and the highest level of contaminants when you measure air contamination is 500, and it was off the charts. Spokane wasn't even registering. It was completely off the charts. They were literally telling people, if there's any way you can stay inside your home and stay home, do it. Um, they were telling people to wear respirators. Uh, it was pretty, pretty insane. It, it pretty quickly dropped down into the 300s. Um, where we are on the beach, normally we get a very strong Pacific wind that comes right in off the water, which is normally really great. But there's so many fires in Oregon, just south of us in California, that it was pulling all of that smoke and ash up here. And there was literally ash dropping on people's yards. And the air quality at the beach was actually in the 300s, which is just completely unheard of up here. So it's- I wanna add some drama. Go, go ahead. <laughs> At one point last week, I read that there was a almost 1 million square mile cloud of smoke hanging off the coast out here wow. in the Pacific. Pacific, yeah. That's so it, it's definitely um, a very crazy, very serious situation. And in the last two weeks, if you can imagine, um, my phone and my email, and my inbox on Facebook has been going crazy with people emailing and asking questions. So what we decided today, and several of those were actually hot shots that reached out to us. So what we decided today, um, we, we were talking with Scott a few days ago and we decided we were gonna come up with the top five questions basically that we're getting asked right now and wanted to go over them with you all and make sure that you guys are, are uh, you know, well-informed, okay? Um, Scott, Kevin, you got anything great to add to that or? I got nothing to add now, I'm speechless. Okay, all right. <laughs> so we all just right. get into it. Good to know. Well, right. so I'll, I'll throw something out there just oh. randomly. Okay. You're probably like, oh my God. Uh-huh. I think, yeah, 
I think that, uh, you know, there's been some interesting, there's been a, a, a number of interesting things come up that we're going to go over today, but this still boils back down to customer experience. Again, in, in some cases, people are used to wildfires because they have them almost every year in, in on the West Coast uh, to some extent or another, but a lot of people that have never actually had to experience them don't really know what to do. And so we have to be their experts and guide them through the process and educate them about what needs to be done and how. And so I think that's very important. And we'll get it, we'll get a little deeper into that. So there you go. All right. All right. Wisdom from Captain. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go on to the very first biggest thing, you guys which was a little surprising to me, but the biggest question that's getting shot at us right now is when do you start the cleanup, right? Like we have ash falling, we have all this horrible smoke lingering outside. How do you start cleaning on the inside of the house when the outside is still so contaminated? Um, Scott ran into this last year. In fact, we were down there with some of his clients so he can throw his two cents in. Yeah, Scott, what do you got to say to that? Uh, clean it twice and get paid twice. There you go. <laughs> no, <Clean it's>, uh, <laughs> that's bad advice, bad 101. Advice. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to definitely be a conversation to have with the homeowner and the insurance company, but obviously you have to let things die down a little bit. Uh, we were actually looking at the weather too and saw that there was some rain coming, and we I thought it was a good idea to wait for the rain to pass through and kind of uh, – wet down some of the ash and soot that was blowing around. Um, but having a conversation with the insurance company about what you're dealing with, because right now and the fires that are burning everywhere, who knows how long that's gonna be. And you're looking at, at trying to balance air quality inside the home yeah. without taking it too far and cleaning and then having to re-clean what just got uh, contaminated. Does it make sense to put somebody up uh, outside and uh, put them up in a hotel or, or something. So it's going to be a lot of questions that you have to ask and interview your client on what is bothering them health wise. Do they have any health issues or respiratory issues that you need to be made aware of? And are they feeling comfortable staying in the house and then kind of just gauge it case by case basis. Right. So right. It's very site specific. Right. Correct. Yeah. Depending, correct. depending on the exterior condition, because I think that's what we ran into last year when we were down there in that one neighborhood was mm -hmm. there was so much smoke and ash outside the house that to clean it up, it would have probably got recontaminated. So would you recommend we clean up outside first or inside first or what? Uh, so we always start outside uh, and then, and then work our way in. And what we what we came across last year was we had people that had no damage thinking they had damage because everybody else said they had damage and they were seeing dollar signs from insurance companies. So the important part is testing the house to actually see if there is any residue you're picking up that is leading you to um, have to do any cleaning efforts. So crawling around in the attic, checking out the insulation is usually one spot that really gets hit pretty hard. So checking out where all the roof vents are and seeing if there's anything that came in through there, uh, checking walls, and window sills and all that. And then the other flip side of that is we had people that had a lot of damage but they didn't think they had anything because the outside air quality was so poor and the odor was so bad that anything was an improvement. So they walked into their house and like, oh, thank God my house doesn't smell. It's like, well, your house just had less of an odor than, out, than was outside. Right. So if you start knowing the areas that have been impacted and just kind of meeting with those people, just you're gonna have to go through and, and use your sponges and check and be able to show them if they do have some contamination that needs to be addressed or not. Yeah, and we're going to go real deep into that, you guys, um, in just a bit about testing and how to know what to clean, what we're going to do that we're going to go into that. But, uh, you know, what Scott and Kevin said is absolutely true. More often than not, when it's wildfire situation, we start from the inside or the outside in. And that's counterintuitive, right? Um, but it's super important to understand, especially if you're traveling to the area and you don't know the area, it's very important for you to understand where in relation to where the fire, the epicenter of the fire started, where the edge of the wildfire is, and has the fire actually been extinguished. Um, one of the big mistake that I see contractors make is they'll just jump in there and literally I've seen them cross like evacuation lines and start cleaning houses 
and the fire's still going. It's still very active and you're wasting your time doing that cleaning at that point. Um, and number one, especially if people are evacuated, but it, it is a kind of a chicken and the egg thing where, like Scott said, if it's not ready because the air quality outside hasn't calmed down or the ash flying around or whatever, um, people may still be in really bad situations in their home. They may have respiratory issues and their air quality is so bad in their home that they need to move out. Um, but for us to start cleaning on the inside of their house, when it's just going to get recontaminated, it just really isn't going to work. Okay. Um, there are some things you can do like Scott sort of touched on, you know, if you're having conversations with their insurance company, if they're with a good insurance company, they will move them out if they have ALE um, on their policy and potentially let you set up, you know, air scrubbers and doing some things to start cleaning the air inside the house, depending on, again, where the level of contamination is outside and has the fire actually stopped or is it still progressing? Um, rain is a huge thing, but oftentimes you guys, before we even start anything on the inside, we want to do things like power. Launching. We want to clean off the exterior. Of we need Robert Johnson to bring his equipment. Yeah, we need Robert Johnson to come be our power washer extraordinaire and you know cleaning off all the sidewalks and the lawn furniture and the windows outside and even even spraying off the landscaping which by the way not to get into a big topic on that but there may or may not be coverage but you still need you can't have loose fluffy ash you guys just flying around on this stuff outside, right or you're just going to recontaminate the inside so it's kind of a tricky thing um often which again, a little counterintuitive. People think about going to the epicenter where you're gonna get a lot of your cleanup in the beginning, you guys, is on the outer edges, right? Like the outside edge of where these houses are affected and then start cleaning the way in as the fire is put out or contained and areas start clearing up and opening up. Um, we and need to I'll mute somebody to get a lot of background noise. Oh, everybody's muted. But me, you, and Scott. Huh. Scott, okay. what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, it, it's very, um, I guess, uh, something to be aware of. All right, you guys. Um, wildfires are burning right now. And for those who are thinking of responding, this is not necessarily the time to mobilize, let's say. Um, but it's definitely the time to prepare right? Like Scott and I just had the conversation right now, you should be making sure you have tons of PPE, PPE stocked up. You have tons of chem sponges, you guys, that you've got lots of HEPA filters, that your HEPA vacuums are up and ready to go because you're going to be using that a lot when it comes to wildfire cleanup. That you have and your hydroxyl of, machines. Yep, you got your hydroxyl, hydroxyl machines all set up. That right now, one of the most important things that you need to be doing is making sure that you are prepared to respond. Okay, you have the supplies and the equipment and the solutions so that you can mobilize. All right. I'll tell you right now, Interlink is out of sponges and out of carbon right. vapor filters for now. Yep. They said there's, there should be more coming in in about a week or two. Yep. So in hindsight, everybody, um, this is stuff that come, what California and Washington burn every year at this time. So next year, set a little timer on your calendar. Uh, that in July, order umpteen cases of sponges and filters. Make sure you have lots of PPE, okay? It's kind of, it's sort of like when the storms happen, you guys, hurricane season, people prepare two months before anything even ever hits. It's the same thing with wildfire, all right? Same with wall wash, 99, you guys need to have lots of stock of that up. All right, so um, let's talk about what Scott touched on. We're gonna go into what do you need to clean and testing, how do you figure that out? Oftentimes people think, uh, Scott, he, he was absolutely on, there's one or two people, either those who think I've got nothing in my house, everything's fine, I can't see anything, any contamination, and it smells better in my house than it does out in my yard, or there, there's the people that are like, oh my gosh, my entire, everything is contaminated, like- I can't breathe. Can't breathe, let's you know, just light a match and get rid of the rest of the house and I need to rebuild. So you have both those, that's usually where people are. There's really not a lot of in between. Um, and what is often the case, and any of you who've done wildfire know this, 
you don't see contamination from wildfire. And often, you really don't realize the smell, the odor contamination when you're living in the house. Because after you walk in, open a few windows and air it out for a little bit and close it back up, again, number one, it smells better than outside usually. Number two, you're used to it. You're acclimated. And there are people that'll say, oh, everything's great in our house, but we just want you to come check it out. I walk in the front door and almost fall over from the odor. You go to their furnace and the filter is black, like black. And then you take a chem sponge, which is your best friend when it comes to wildfires, you guys. Absolutely, you're gonna use a ton of them for cleaning and that's how we test. I know Emily just went through testing with those uh, in Billings and they are literally a marketing magic tool. Um, people who will think that there's nothing in their home, you take one of those sponges, rub it on a wall and pull it back and show them just how much black soot is on their walls um, and they're ready to move out. They're like, okay, I'm out of here. We need to decontaminate this whole house. So it's also important with wildfires, um, as Scott mentioned, you know, that you check the attics. The vents in the roof will allow so much ash in. And if you only clean the inside of the house and don't go up and check the attic and test potentially for contamination, you're gonna recontaminate very quickly. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, and, and the other thing about wildfires, you guys, is just like a house fire. Some rooms will be completely, oh, excuse me. Sorry, my bad. Um, cool. <laughs> some rooms will be completely just terrible, covered everywhere. And yet the room right next to it, nothing. We test with a chem sponge. There is nothing, no ash, no soot anywhere in that room. So just because there's been a wildfire doesn't mean you have to clean every single room. But on that note, um, Kevin, talk a bit about the deodorizing though. Like what if we don't have to clean a room, but there's still the odor in there? How do we handle that and deodorize? Well, sure, because we have the two main culprits in any of this are odor and residue. And one could be present without the other. So you could have no residue, but you could still have odor because obviously odor is airborne and it can find its way around. You open up a door after the fact, odor is going to go in if it's in the rest of the building. And so you're always going to have to deodorize and then you're also going to have to clean, which is where you need the testing. And so one of the things that we did when we did the 100K in 10 days on a wildfire cleanup down in Utah was we brought in a pallet of about 50 of the Odorox machines and we were using them basically to start, jumpstart and sign contracts with uh, homeowners that needed some relief. And so they got some immediate results when we, obviously if you guys have all seen how quickly uh, the Odorox generator starts making a difference. And so I, I just was going around and signing people and saying, oh, I can get this equipment in your house today and then we can schedule you for a cleaning in the next few days or week. And so, that was a great marketing tool for us. And then we went in and did our sponge testing to determine what areas were affected throughout the house and which areas were not so that we could know where to clean. And then we sent our cleaning crews in. And we were doing about 10 or $11,000 a day in cleanups. I think we had what, two or three crews going? Right. And so they were, they were light cleanups, you know, it wasn't like, like a fire that was on the inside of a building where you're gonna have a lot more potential residue and, and odor, but you know, light cleanups where we can knock out about three a day, and they were, you know, five to seven thousand dollars per, which would probably be more because that's been a few years ago. You can easily double that in today's market for sure. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that a lot of these people, this was a huge situation where these were the outline areas that we started in, and people did not realize they had contamination. They had no idea until we educated them. Which I think is the best, the best story on the whole bunch was the home that we were standing in that had an infant child crawling across the white carpet and they were not sure if they had any kind of a residue issue in there and so mm -hmm. as we were talking the baby crawled to the mom the mom picked the baby up and as soon as she picked the baby up she was horrified to see that her baby's hands and feet and knees uh, were black walking or crawling across a white carpet and she didn't realize that's how dirty that floor was and she just crawled a few feet across the floor so yeah. it's it's hard to tell when it's all the same tint of residue throughout the house unless you move an object like a, a bowl on a counter or a picture on a wall or something like that and you can see the difference 
even on a white carpet, they couldn't tell there was sit there until the, and I said, can I borrow that baby? Maybe she got a commission. Right. right. <laughs> that that <laughs> was actually quite horrific. Side. And that mother, they immediately moved out. They were like, <laughs> um, where do we sign? You decontaminate my house and I'm out of here. So <laughs> that, but that's part of that education process, which we're going to get into big time here in a few minutes when we start talking about the client experience and how to get the jobs. Because those that was a really easy sale. Yeah, those, those two <laughs> last parts really um, go side by side. So I want to talk a little bit about coverages now, you guys. This Before is, you get to that, yeah. we, on the testing, we talked about using the sponges to yeah. test. Actually, have the, uh, have the testing company capabilities, too, with getting like your oh, yeah. soot, char, and ash testing done. Right. And you probably remember, Anissa, the one that we brought you guys in on um, the ATP. for the live class. Right. They did they did testing on they did air quality testing in the house and then they did it outside and this was within weeks after the fire and the air quality in the home was worse than outside yeah right around the wildfire so having that I mean this insurance company was playing really just very difficult and even with the testing they were still fighting it but it's good to have that testing mm -hmm. uh, that you can rely on too by an independent agency Absolutely. you know besides just going using your uh, your sponges and taking pictures of that and sending it in so it's just something to kind of keep in mind if you need to bring in an environmental consultant um, they, they can do those char and ash testing and help with protocols as well and i want to point so out so I'm, I'm curious the yeah. the piece of equipment that robert and Ajit has will that do that as well or is that just strictly a mold thing uh, you'd have to ask him on that. Okay. I can't understand him. He's got a mask on. So Robert, Just read his lips. Right. <laughs> well, well, Robert is hopefully going to be able to answer that. I want to point out that um, we do have connections, Scott and I, with a really amazing environmental um, hygienist in San Diego area. He actually specializes in kind of an expert on testing for wildfire. Um, and he can work with anyone, anywhere across the country. You can actually send you um, test things so that you have them on hand. You can take the test, FedEx it to him, and have test results back in as little as 48 hours. So if you guys want that resource, reach out um, to Scott or I, and we can, we can hook you up with him. His name's Matt, and he's an amazing guy. Robert, are you... I'm going to unmute you because I don't know if you can unmute yourself. And let's see if we can hear you. It's mainly for mold, so it can okay. give you particle or chart. It doesn't identify. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. You just take the mask off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 tell him to do that. That <laughs> freaks me out. Oh. So um, yeah. So anyway, testing is not only to understand how far we need to go in cleaning what areas. It also goes to help educate our clients and show them evidential what support. Of, what kind of you stole my tagline, Kevin? <laughs> um, what kind of you know educating our clients is they may not understand their level of contamination as as Kevin stole my thunder. Yes, it is also testing, as Scott said, can be evidential support that we can use to support a claim with an insurance policy. And that is gonna lead us into our next topic, which is huge. Um, depend, and we're gonna talk about coverages, okay? Now, we have Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Montana, and then we have California, right? California is like the state of, or the, the country of California. They have their own very special rules. And Scott's gonna get into some detail about California and how they deal with insurance and the wildfire situation. In our state, um, in Oregon, I can speak to this. We, wildfires are covered, period. It's covered. Um, it doesn't matter that it comes from outside the home. The fire doesn't have to happen inside the home. It's covered. I believe Idaho is the same. Emily, correct me if Montana is different, um, but they cover the wildfire type situations and that cleanup. Um, it, yeah, okay, Emily said good. So Scott, again, California being a little different as it is, um, has, does have some challenges when it comes to coverages. And Scott, I want you to speak to that a little bit, especially you know that uh, question that we got from Jason that I detailed answered him. Um, he's actually in the Bay Area, California, and he's having some challenges getting 
um, losses covered. You want to speak to that a little bit, Scott, in California? Yeah, I guess his issue was with State Farm. Um, I haven't seen that with State Farm yet. Uh, I had difficulties with farmers last time where they were trying to put a cap of $5,000 on uh, the smoke jobs. I know that wasn't super successful. Uh, we dealt with AAA. We actually dealt with an adjuster from AAA, a past adjuster, who said that they were told to they can only write a check for $2,500, even if the damage was $30,000, let them sue us, um, was, was that mentality. Um, but the only carrier that I, could, that I know off the top of my head is Western Mutual and Residence Mutual, which, which has an exclusion for any cleaning uh, activities, and that's going to be for mold, for bacteria, and for fires. Um, so I'm not sure I know the success or the cap that they were going to try to push was not really successful. Mm -hmm. A lot of PAs got involved in it and started looking at, uh, looking at the policy language. Uh, we haven't secured any fires recently. They're still burning here, so we'll see uh, what we come across now. But I'm curious. I got to reach out to Jason too yeah. and see what's going on with State Farm. Well, and what was the name of that one that we ran into with that couple? Uh, it was Pacific something. Michelle. Pacific and, and Specialty. Were, or Pacific, yeah, they were trying to yeah. deny it too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as well as on the. And that's where testing came cleanups. into play, right? That's where evidential support came hugely into play uh, with that. Well, and the fact that the homeowners actually got an attorney in that situation. But um, I, I want you guys to know, by the way, since you and I um, talked, Scott, I reached out via email and asked to have a conversation with Ed Cross, the restoration lawyer in our industry, who's doing some pretty great things with the RAA and uh, getting Xactimate to get their act together. And I reached out to him. He's in California in Palm Springs and was talking with him about that and wanted, wanted to have some conversation with him, okay, about California and them denying those claims um, and, and the total $2,500 limit and all of that. So I'll get back to you guys and let you know. In fact, I'm actually asking Ed if he'll do an Ask Anissa interview with me so that we can talk about this right now and post that up on my channel. So if we can do that, I'll get that to you guys as well in the group. So there, there's definitely some weird um, languages uh, on coverage. You know, this is where you guys, we've always said this and, and Scott, Kevin and I are an advocate of this. I know there are some in the industry that feel otherwise, but it is very important to have conversation with your adjuster uh, when you are doing losses and especially in this kind of situation, having a conversation before you just walk in and sign and do, you know, $200,000 worth of fire cleanup work and then learn that the insurance company's not going to cover it. Uh, because chances are you're going to have an issue with a homeowner covering that check as well. Um, and it's just not a good way to do business, right? Like if the homeowner is like, look, my house is contaminated. I got a credit card. I'm paying for you to clean that's fine, but they should know that up front, right? Not while you're, you know, after the fact that you've already got the job done and you hand them this big bill, they should completely understand that that's gonna be um, having to come out of their pocket and or them fighting their insurance company for it. So communication here is huge, uh, very, very much. And, and a little bit of educating on your client's part, but I'm gonna say this caveat and I say it all the time, you guys, don't you dare attempt to interpret your client's insurance policy, okay? You are not the insurance company, you are not the adjuster. You need to direct them to their adjuster as far as the language of policy and verification of coverages, yes, okay? I'll speak to that one claim that we were on together too, just taking a step further, yeah. of having a conversation with the adjuster. Sometimes those conversations don't go well, which I think we all got to experience firsthand. Yeah. Um, you got to invoke the, the policyholder or encourage the policyholder to ask the right questions to both their carrier. But in this situation, the carrier sent one of their preferred vendors in and, and who it is doesn't really matter, but they were writing these estimates out and they were getting them out like five, 10 minutes because they just had a mass amount of homes that they had to get to. And we were so far off between what their estimate was and, and what our estimate was. And it appeared that the scope of work was kind of close um, to an extent, but in having a conversation with the preferred vendor, we found out that their initial estimate was just to go in and vacuum the, right. the carpets and just do like a quick clean. And if that wasn't successful, then they would go into HEPA vacuuming. If that wasn't successful, then they would go into wet cleaning. So right. the actual depth of our scope was nowhere near 
the same and none of that is really made aware to the homeowner or the insurance company. So if you're really far off in your scope of work or if you're in your price, maybe get the homeowner to ask either the carrier to explain what that entails or whoever wrote that initial estimate to really explain what is that price, what is that price going to get me? How far into the scope of work is it going to do? Because we had a we had a homeowner with severe respiratory issues that was struggling to breathe in the home and they were going to go with the most minimal step and only go to the next step if she continued to have um, respiratory issues or or an odor in the home so just um i guess ask the right questions and, and get the homeowner to ask the right questions too not only to the carrier but whoever wrote that initial estimate it could be an independent adjuster a preferred vendor or whatever it's just going to help give you more ammunition Absolutely. And Scott, it is our responsibility, I believe, as a restoration contractor to help. I don't want to use the word coach because that almost sounds like we're educate. setting them up, but educate our client on the right questions to ask and the right concerns to convey, right? So yeah, and I knew well, that beautifully with that client. And by the way, I want to point out that client wasn't just, oh, I have breathing problems. She medically had documented severe uh, problems. So in being able to educate her on the right things to bring out her concerns and questions to the insurance company was huge and went a long way in them getting that claim covered. So those are and just- this preferred vendor was really acting in collusion with the adjuster in minimizing what was needed to be doing and that's why educating the customer and doing the testing and showing them the areas to be concerned with is going to give them the ammunition they need right. to make sure they get the job done correctly and, and to the extent that it needs to be done right right and that brings us around you guys to honestly these were great important things that we just covered but the last two things really go hand in hand and in our opinion is the most important thing and the most important part for you to get down and understand when it comes to this kind of loss. Listen, when people, are, if you could imagine, so when we were over in Spokane and this started, we were, we were staying in our daughter's uh, driveway in our uh, Sprinter van, our camper that we built into the Sprinter van. And I opened the door of the van one morning. And when I opened it, usually I see this beautiful timbered pasture and it's just blue sky and it's wonderful. I opened the van door and immediately was hit in the face, literally with the smoke. I could not see more than just a few hundred feet. I could not see my daughter's trees that line her pasture. The smoke was so thick. And I immediately thought, oh my gosh, I have to get in her house. I have to pull up my laptop. Maybe we have to evacuate. Like that, that's how bad this was. And this is not like, this is me. I, I do fires all the time. It, it's not normally something that panics me, but I was legitimately concerned. And I ran in the house, pulled it up, and sure enough, we were not in evacuation. That's just how, there was no fires around us. That's just how bad that the fire was. But I remember that feeling in the pit of my stomach and in my heart that I thought, oh my gosh, like, what if we need to evacuate? And the next day, by the way, our daughter, Chelsea, who lives on the south side of Spokane, she was put on alert for four hours for possible evacuation. So her brother, Travis, which most of you know, lives on the other side of town. He called her up and said, I can be at your house in 10 minutes with my truck. My daughter started grabbing her computers, her family pictures off the wall. It was, it, it, that's the closest our family has ever come to involvement like this. And I remember just thinking, it, it, it was it was a bit it, it, well it, it was a little terrifying to tell you the truth and that kind of surprised me that I felt like that um, just again because I have so much experience with this you would think I'd be a lot calmer but you know I guess it's like an ER doctor you know you can see all kinds of car accidents but until the car accident involves your family you really don't get it so we have to think about what people are going through that have been literally so Chelsea was put on a four hour um, uh, a, a evacuation watch. So alert, had they said, done, you're evacuating, she would add 20 minutes to get out of her apartment. 20 minutes, you guys. So stop and think right now, you have 20 minutes to get out of your house, what do you do? I mean, I'd be grabbing my cats, my dog, I'd be like grabbing pictures. I mean, it's a panicky feeling. And so you have to really, really get present to what people are dealing with. This is not just Mary Maids 
coming in and cleaning up their house because they chose to have a deep spring cleaning. These people have potentially been through some pretty traumatic situation. They might have been literally pushed out of their house by authorities, their street blocked off and told they can't go back in. And they're wondering if their house is even going to be standing tomorrow. Are they even going to have a home to come back to? Like this is some massively emotional, very difficult stuff. So what Emily I Emily can speak to that. Emily can actually speak to that. Emily actually lost the majority of her house in a fire two years ago. And Emily's been in this industry for, I don't know, better, most of her life. She was raised in this industry. Um, so now what we're going to talk about is just that, you guys, client experience and how to get the job. And I want, Scott, you and Kevin speak really good to this. And I've watched you both with people. I've watched you with clients. You guys are amazing at connecting with them and really talk about what does the client experience got to do with marketing and what does education have to do with both of those two things? So, well, here's the deal in a nutshell, you got to gain people's trust and you got to show them by educating them, just like we talked about earlier, that whether or not they have an issue that needs to be resolved and then how you would go about doing it. Mm -hmm. And then if you can get one person in a neighborhood to have you come in and do the cleaning, you can wind up getting the whole neighborhood because people will talk to each other. And that's exactly what happened to us in our last cat loss fire uh, the neighbors came across the street and down the street and came up to see what kind of results we were giving to the homeowner that we were working with who was somebody that you know didn't know us from adam when we came down there and we wound up getting such a rave review from her that literally everybody down the, both sides of the street said me next and so we just lined them up and knocked them down. And, and so we went through the same process with each one because again, back to the experience and the education, you can't gloss over that even though it feels like you've got it in the bag because you still need to give them the right experience. So going in and doing the testing and educating about the process and what needs to be done, we orchestrate the outcome. We're in charge, we're in control. It's, it's up to us, it, you know, we're the experts in their eyes. And so you need to go in there, inform them, educate them, and then tell them what you're going to do and then execute on it. And if you do that correctly, you're going to have raving fans and you're going to have people lining up to be the next people to get the house clean, which is exactly what happened for us. So and, they'll do the marketing for you. Well, and I want to point out one of the things that we also did that was just tremendous, you guys, is going into these neighborhoods, as we talked about, and doing your clean, bringing your testing kit. And a testing kit um, literally consists of a Ziploc bag. It'd be really great to have like your company sticker logo on that bag or something. Um, and uh, several Q-tips, six Q-tips, a pair of gloves to protect your hands, a pair of booties, and a slice. We would take a chem sponge and we cut it into four pieces and just take a piece of that. Now, you don't normally cut chem sponges, we all know, because it makes them inefficient. But for testing purposes, that was all we were wanting to do. And we were wanting these to go further since obviously there was um, a tough time getting chem sponges when all of this was going on and we don't want to just waste them. So a small piece of the chem sponge, we were handing these testing kits out at a local grocery store that we got permission to set up in front of. You could do it at a school, you could do it- um, the brochure. It, and a brochure about what to do. Um, and how to test to see if you have contamination in your home. Um, but you could do this by just walking literally door to door in a neighborhood. And the one thing we did not do, you guys, we sold nothing. We did not sell just our services. offer. We offered a free testing kit and taught them how to use it. That's all we did. And what happened was we had several people say, um, would you just come to my house and do the testing for me? We're like, absolutely no worries. Well, as soon as we did that, <laughs> um, you know, like the baby, the one of the couples was the baby crawling on the floor. But then immediately we got into one, two, three houses in a, in a city block or in the neighborhood. And before you knew it, we were in all 22 houses of the neighborhood or whatever. So education when it comes to this, you guys, is incredible. And the more, the way you educate and how you educate and the more you educate your client is going to dictate the experience that they have with you, which is what is going to put your marketing on steroids. And you will have, I promise you, all the work 
that you want without paying for SEO, without paying for AdSense or any of that. Now, I'm not saying don't do their advocate. Right. I'm, I'm not saying don't do those things and there isn't a place for them, but we're just talking about a unique alternative that um, people don't think about. And it, to us, it adds the human touch, right? Because what we do in this industry, um, it, and I, you know, a friend of mine, um, uh, Kevin Jones said, I'm sorry, yeah. Jeff Jones, uh, the president of uh, GBAC, he said this so well. In this industry, we are dealing with the human condition. That's what we do. Okay. So remember that. And especially when you're dealing with a wildfire type situation where people are in a panic and concerned and have just been very traumatized, uh, potentially, depending on where they were in an evacuation or not, you are dealing with a lot of humanity there. So the more that you can put your hands on with that, to me, is just way better. I mean, Scott, you, you've been doing this how many seasons have you been doing wildfires in California now? Three or four, five? Seven. Seven. Oh my gosh, it's been that long. We've known you that long. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and would you not agree with that? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's perfect. I mean, it's um, the, the client experience starts from the first phone call or the first introduction. So taking the time to listen, because they're going to have lots of questions to really listen instead of just hammering information down. Uh, you know, down to them over the phone, just really listen to all the concerns, uh, get all the information, ask the right questions, which is going to establish yourself as a professional, like you actually know what you're talking about. Right. But even just from the first interaction, it's how you show up. Is your truck clean? Are you clean? Or does it look like you just got out of a crawl space? Are you dirtier than the house or you're going to come in and clean? <laughs> um, you got to have everything lined up, your ladder, your, your sponges, uh, any of your towels, just present yourself that you're organized and ready to go because especially with wildfire, it is the opportunity to just blow your company up because all of their neighbors are impacted and neighbors talk. They really do. It's, if you're doing a good job, everybody's going to find out about it. If you're doing a terrible job, everybody's going to find out about it. Mm -hmm. So just um, coming in and, and a lot of times they've already met with multiple companies. They may have met with the insurance company, uh, the adjuster, the preferred vendor, so are you giving them better information or more detailed information than the other guy? That's what's going to set yourself apart. Right. Be yeah. frank and honest. Yeah. It, and you know, and, and it's, listen, you guys, marketing in this, well, I, we believe this in every scenario, but especially in this situation, marketing is not about selling yourself. Marketing is about serving those who are in need. Okay. What Scott said, it's very true. You want to blow your company up. This is a number one way to do it. And we're not talking about something, by the way, that takes thousands, tens of thousands, 50,000, $100,000 worth of dry out equipment here. We're talking about the majority of items that you need to do this work, you guys, besides some HEPA air scrubbers and your odor oxide hydroxyl machines is janitorial supplies. Like the, the equipment to get into this is so minimal. It's not even funny. It's not. And there is a tremendous need at last, which I believe was Friday, my last stats between uh, California and Scott, correct me if you, if, if this has gone up that you know of California has almost four and a half million acres that I have burnt and or are burning right now. Okay. Oregon is almost a million and Washington's 800,000. And I don't even know how much Idaho and Montana have had because they've had fires as well. So there is such a need. I, I know that you guys are probably tired of hearing me say this because I've been saying it for years. There is such an incredible need. So many people go out to hurricanes. So many people go out and do the dry outs in the water. There is such a deficit of good, qualified, trained, equipped people to go out and do this kind of restorative cleaning when it comes to wildfires and fires that it's 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 quite tragic okay there's not enough contractors in the state of california currently to handle this work so if you live there um you should be definitely blowing your company up and doing this kind of work if you don't you should consider traveling and doing this work there is a great need um in california i know that you have to have certain licensing in our state you do as well but it's not that hard to get in our state you can also partner with someone who is actually in that state um, in fact, 
um, just, I don't know, Scott, I didn't actually approve this with you beforehand, but I'll just kind of give you guys a little sneak peek announcement. Um, Scott's about an hour to an hour and a half from a whole lot of these fires. And he's probably going to sign many of these jobs. I'm sure he will. And so him and I were talking the other day and um, I'm potentially going to be going down and helping uh, him in, in all of that. I mean, not that he can't handle it, but just obviously if I'm there, we can handle more work together. Right, Scott? Um, but this is an incredible opportunity for us to do some hand, live hands-on training experience with any of you that have not done wildfire cleanup or have done it and haven't done it well, or who just want to get the experience of actually having the experience out there on the job, doing it from A to Z, like, processing houses. Um, when we go out on these kind of losses that we get going, we can easily process several houses in a day. So you you can literally get some hands-on experience to just flow through jobs and understand the, the release forms and the signatures and the protocols and the invoicing and all of that, documentation, photographing. So if you guys are interested in that, you've got to be sure and reach out to me and or Scott and let us know uh because we're only going to take so many people doing that um the last time we did this uh, a couple weeks back in montana we we maxed out at eight people and we filled that up in like less than three days that class and i've still got people i have two people on a waiting list so i think two of those spots scott are already taken um so it will be limited all right because it is that intense and hands-on and i want to be able to do a lot with you and and, and so does scott and and kevin who will be there as well so anyway I just want to kind of throw that out at you, but I kind of want to open this up. We've been on for almost an hour now. Um, Scott, Kevin, you guys totally can jump in and say anything, but I want to also open this up to anybody that has any questions. All right. <laughs> Quick question. Uh, so for customers who are kind of waiting on filing a claim, what kind of advice you should give them as far as documentation or documenting? or in the attic or what's, what's a good thing for them to get ready for the claim, you know? Right. Okay. That is a super good question. Scott, I want you to speak to that, but I want to give you a warning here. One of the things, it's very important that they do documentation right away because for those that are waiting, what they'll do, what does the missus do? Just what I would do. I'm not going to sit there with my house being gross. I'm going to start cleaning. And then all of a sudden they clean and it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's nothing here. This kitchen doesn't need to be cleaned out because she already did it. So Scott, let's talk a little bit about that. I know you and I have experienced that together on jobs. Yeah, so essentially if they're they're calling you, they're calling you for a reason. They, they obviously have damage or they think they have damage. So it, it's gonna go back to your questionnaire. You know, is it something that's it's a healthy environment for them to be in? Can they stay in that environment? Do they need to call their insurance now and be relocated? Um, out of the house because they have respiratory issues or it's hard to breathe. Uh, it goes into a conversation with the insurance adjuster. You know, based on this situation, the client feels comfortable staying in the home. I think we should drop some air filtration devices. Would you approve the rental of that? We're waiting for some time for this fire to die down. Here's, here's what our anticipation is. If they can approve that, great. Good luck just doing it without that communication and then getting them to pay for it. You've got to have some communication, some understanding. Right. If they don't want to do that, well, then, hey, this client may have to, you know, seek for to go to a hotel or to be displaced from their home. So having the communication is going to be good. If you just do nothing, the client's probably just going to think that you're busy and forgot about them because they don't they don't always tell you when they're ready to start. But I would definitely get in the house and start doing um, your your testing and seeing the extent of the damage and building that relationship and that um that comfort with the client and yourself and have those conversations with the insurance. That's what I would recommend because it's so easy for the carrier to get this claim pulled from you and put their preferred vendor yep. in there. Yep. If they're having these conversations without you. Yep. And Scott, so the, I, that is huge. And the two things, Scott, I want to really point out when he's talking about testing, he's talking about the testing, like the attic, the, you know, with a hygienist. Okay. And then we're also talking about the chem sponge testing. And I know, um, Robert uh, Johnson, uh, you haven't done a hands-on experience with this, so we haven't done that with you, but I know Robert, Hidaji, you have. When you're testing in those rooms with those chem sponges, I literally will put the room sign next to the sponge 
and I will show it. I film myself doing the testing and I'll show the results, all that black on the sponge and the date and I'll snap photograph of that. Okay. Um, save, I've saved those sponges in Ziploc bags, write the date on it so that I, and, and I will keep up, keep that with me. If I going to assign that job, sometimes I've given them to the homeowner, but I get a little leery about that. But both those testings in the beginning, before Mrs. has a chance to start cleaning stuff up, you guys, cause she's gonna, if they're still living in the house, she's not going to not do that. Um, is very, very important. And noting the date that that testing was done is, is really huge. Yeah, I, I agree. And our communication with, with the insurance adjusters is going overboard right now. Right now we got fires everywhere. We've got hurricanes coming in left and right. Their money that they're paying out is ridiculous. And they're looking for ways to get out of paying things. I just went through a loss with State Farm, where it was a sewer backup from a main line. We didn't do the, the pretest to see if it was contaminated because it was a sewer backup. Um, but we got everything cleaned up and we did post bacterial swab testing. It came back clean and the adjuster literally said they will not pay for that because we didn't do an initial test to confirm that it was contaminated. So I was like, I thought I was doing you a favor by saving you five, $600. So obviously they paid for it when it all went around, but don't just go right to a hygienist, call the insurance company, say, Hey, I got pictures. Are you going to take my word that this is contaminated? This insulation needs to go. Or do you want me to go ahead and have a hygienist come and do such and ash testing? And you're kind of setting them to do these approvals for additional money. You may actually get a really good relationship with an insurance adjuster that thinks that you're looking out for their bottom line by just including them in the decision making. And they may refer you to other homes that they have going. That's a reality that does happen. And it really starts with your communication. Yep. Yep. Huge. Huge. Kevin, did you have something to add to that? Well, I was just going to emphasize that, yeah, I mean, right now the insurance companies are getting their asses handed to them because of all these losses, all this cat loss stuff all over the country. And so, I mean, we're getting hurricanes like crazy. I mean, this is probably, I'm, I'm curious to see what the total comes out to this year because we've had way more hurricanes and fires than we've had in a while. So, I'm, um, yeah, they're looking for ways to dodge the bullet right now because they get beat up. And so we got to be careful. All right, you guys. Well, we have any more last thoughts, Scott and Kevin, or any other questions? I guess we yeah. can. One last thing. Yes. So you've done a really good job with your company with building a um, a set standard from appearance, right? With guys wearing their scrubs and they look uniform and clean. And I think I, I just challenge or, or ask you guys to look out for when you go to these wildfire areas, look at the companies and look at the yeah. chaos and the dis, the misorganization or disorganization or whatever you want to say of just the appearance alone. So I'd say that you should look at your company and we did this, we did a group shot picture and I was like, Oh my God, we look like freaking scrubs. We've got 34 employees, <laughs> this guy's in shorts, this guy's in pants, this guy's got blue jeans, this guy's right. got khakis. Right. So we brought uniforms in. So we actually looked apart. We spent the money on the vehicle wraps seven years ago to look good, but then we were losing in the simple thing of our personnel looking right. consistent. Mm -hmm. We know that a lot of companies go and they just hire a bunch of temps. That can really lose faith in some homeowners that see that. So even just building your brand and your consistency all the way through your employees is gonna set that professional image for your company and set you apart from everybody else. Optics are huge. We know this from our current pandemic. Yeah, right. Scott, that was huge. I'm so glad you mentioned that. You know, and I, I got to tell you guys, not only, let me get it, not only are the scrubs something, but here's something I'll even add to that. Do you guys see this? That's a badge. Okay, it's got my name on it. It says Contents and Structure Cleaning Specialist. Um, on the back is all my company information, and this hangs on my scrubs. So let me tell you, when I show up to a job, and I've got red scrubs, which, you know, scream professional, educated, emergency person who's skilled and can take care of trauma. And I've got a badge on top of it. It's like, it's like I've got clearance. It's like I'm certified. Photo ID. Which, by the way, goes a long way. When you're dealing with wildfire situations, I don't know if any of you on this call haven't been on those, I've had to go through security checks. You don't just get in to neighborhoods when this stuff is going on. I know Scott, you've experienced this and me having scrubs in this badge 
they just immediately go, oh, you're back. Oh, okay. They look at my, they don't even know. They don't know who the ICRC is or Anissa Koi, but I got a badge. So they just let me throw. And then of course, when I'm knocking on someone's door or talking to them, this screams licensed, certified, professional, ready to help in a trauma situation. So what you said, Scott's huge. Um, and we see it all the time. People spend thousands on truck wraps. And then I see them get out and wildfire jobs. And you guys, their team is wearing shorts. Look, I get it. I don't care if it's 110 degrees in Arizona. My crew had better not show up in a pair of shorts on a job. Okay. Not, not happening. Um, bad thing, bad thing. So anyway, good, good thing that you mentioned Scott. And I'm glad that you did. And by the way, uh, like my scrubs, you guys, I order them on Amazon. You can have them logoed, but we're talking like $25 a person per set. We're not talking about a lot of money here. Um, you can get more expensive uniforms, but then logoing them is about $15 a set. Okay. Name back. These are $8 on nametagwizard.com. Oh, and then these little cool things that I love. They're like a dollar each at the dollar store or $2.50 at Staples. Okay. So invest. What Scott said is true. And that you guys is a huge marketing piece as well. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, um, I think we're right at about an hour. We try to keep these at an hour. Thank you all so much for um, being on the call. Um, I know Eric was actually on a fire job, wildfire job, and desperately wanted to be on. I did record this tonight. Don't normally record them. Uh, we do these live and that's it. But I really wanted several others that I knew couldn't be on. Eric's one of them tonight uh, to be able to take advantage of the training. So I am gonna post this in the group. And uh, if you guys have any other questions or topics you want us to cover, please do uh, let us know, post it in the group. And we're going to get back on track with all of this. I want to know what job Robert's on. I know. Robert, what, what, <laughs> what are you on? What, let me unmute you. What are you doing? Somebody have bad gas or what? Uh, it's a big mold job. It's a Bangalore property. Hasn't been lived in for maybe three years. So this is like the garage. But it's mold everywhere, so I have to get everything. Wow. Wow. Oh. Nice job. And I'm one person, so <laughs> so it took me a while. But. Wow. Yeah. Time to start hiring. I know. <laughs> you got to look into Coletta, man. <laughs> no, I got helpers, but they just don't show up sometimes, you know? So it's just, you know, so I'm it. Well, God bless you for doing that. <laughs> right? All right. Well, we wind up coming down there, Robert, um, to work with Scott on those. You'll have to come do some wildfire with us. All right. All right. We'll do. <laughs> Absolutely. I know you're in the neighborhood. And Mr. Johnson, I know you're clear in Atlanta, but we would love to have you come out and do some wildfire with us too. So you might consider it's probably going to be um, first or second week in November, I'm guessing. Um, what I've, I've talked to Kevin uh, last week about it. I'm highly interested in just kind of taking a flight out there and uh, I know I can talk to people and I, know I can sell them on getting their house decontaminated. Um, just trying to work out more or less the infrastructure of transporting my equipment from Atlanta to California or renting equipment there. I figured just kind of getting there, the work's there. Yeah. Um, I just kind of got to connect the dots between the work, me, and getting the insurance to pay for it. Right. Um, so that's that's kind of my goal i do have a intentions on going there because with so many acres being burnt out um i say the average home may be on what a half an acre so that's probably like two million or a million homes or even half a million and i feel like a few at least 10 of them are mine you know right uh, <laughs> at least 10 if i can get right. 10 i'm happy right um, but i do have plans on going out when everything kind of settles down yeah um yeah and well, I'm an expert in pressure washing, so that, I know they need that. That's I know right. it. So you I'm guys, make something. Robert actually has a great power washing company in Atlanta. He's just getting into this in part of the industry, into actual restoration uh, further, because he already does restoration cleaning with power washing. But Robert, that's, you know, when we wind up on jobs uh, down there, we do this with Scott. We'll bring people in from all over the country to do that hands-on with us. And that's exactly what you're going to get, is how to connect all those pieces. So we'll keep you posted. We'll be posted in the Hot Shots group um, um, if that's going to come to fruition. Because I, I was watching a few of Ed's videos 
And I didn't know that it was that much litigation that's involved right. when you're talking about being licensed in that state and right. being able to contract in that state. And, right. you know, the three day ability to cancel upon yeah. work authorization. Yeah. Like there's just a lot of litigation and fine, fine details. I really didn't know when he brought it to my attention. I was like, wow, it's not just going to California and knocking yeah. on doors and sticking hydroxyls in there. And that's You're why it's important. Mistake. Yeah, that's why it's important, especially in California, is if you have a contractor that you can partner with, like Scott is a great example of that or someone, because like in our state, you can come in and you can literally get a business license from out of state and come in and do wildfire work in our state, a whole lot easier than California. But obviously, mm -hmm. California has a lot more of the wildfires. So Welcome to California. Right. And you know, another state, you guys, funny enough, that is so crazy with their rules it's utah did you know in utah if you go in and do work for someone and you do not hand them an invoice that they sign before any work gets started you cannot collect on that invoice it's crazy i know utah what? of all states it's such a random we learned that um the hard way um we got paid but as soon as i learned it after we had done like a half a dozen jobs so as soon as that happened we got them all signed so anyway it is very important to just not jump in your truck and run um and understand those that's why we teach that robert you've got to understand 15, 1500 miles uh right. just kicking up my bootstraps and saying hey look the work's here i can find the equipment but there's a lot more litigation and, and fine details that's involved. So I may, uh, Scott, if you don't mind, I may PM you. Um, sure. Kind of run a few ideas by you. Uh, not, you know, in the, not coming now, but in the future, uh, I'm sure we can make it a mutual beneficial relationship. Sounds good. Awesome. 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 All right, you well, guys. Well, on that note, you all have a fantastic Monday evening and, Thanks. uh, we will uh, see y'all on some training next Monday. How's that? All right. All right. We'll see you I thought I saw you guys. I show you guys the view from the house here. Yeah, that was pretty. <laughs> I was out there. So this is right above the garage. This is what's all messed up that caused all the mold issue downstairs. So. Wow. Right. Yeah. But it's, pretty view, though. It'll be nice when it's done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, y'all be yeah. safe. See you guys. See you. Take care right. next week. Okay.